May I now invite Mr. K. P. Narayana Kumar, General Secretary, MMBA, to come over to the dais. Now I request the guest speaker, Honorable Mr. Justice Dhamma Sheshadri Naidu, former judge of Bombay High Court, Senior Advocate, Supreme Court of India, to be escorted to the dais. Now I request Mr. S. Venkatesh, Treasurer, MMBA, to honor the guest speaker of the session with a memento. Now I request Mr. K. R. R. Ayapamani to adore the speaker with the traditional shawl. Thank you, sirs. On behalf of the MMBA, I would like to share a few words about the guest speaker. Be not afraid of greatness. Some are born great, some achieve greatness, and others have greatness thrust upon them. I take immense honor and privilege in introducing the man of greatness, Honorable Mr. Justice Dhamma Sheshadri Naidu, former judge, Bombay High Court, Senior Advocate, Supreme Court of India. Our guest speaker enrolled as an advocate in the year 1997. He was elevated as an additional judge of the High Court of Andhra Pradesh in the year 2013. As a personage of the bar and the bench, he demitted the office of judge of the High Court and adorns the robe of senior advocate in the Apex Court. The past 26 years has been an uphill battle for Sir. He has authored law books such as the Law of Stamp Duty, Trade Registration in the Andhra Pradesh, and and the Andhra Pradesh Education Code, etc. He was also the guest faculty at the Andhra Pradesh Judicial Academy. In one of his judgments, he has written the following verse. Nature is, expects the man to move away from a spreading tree, but the law wants the tree to move away from the man. I am bound by law, though not a tree. I am not free. Therefore, I decide this case, decide it in the man's favor and against the tree. So it is the requiem of a falling tree and a failing human. And we have found our Indian father of alliteration, the Shakespeare of the South. We all were apes before this intelligence hit us to the human evolution. The ability to learn, understand, reason and think is termed to be intelligence. Such an intelligence is not limited to us anymore. Machines have started the learning process and we named it as artificial intelligence. With the help of simulator network and that is called neural schema, the processing unit of machines have started to compete with the intelligence of humans. The analytical feeding has gone up to the extent of processing and computing the data to understand the behavior of humans and remodel themselves by even showing the emotions of humans in the form of emote icons. Such a growth will definitely lay two roads. With the evolution of AI, the human limits and disabilities can be shadowed and overcome in one road. With the evolution of AI, the need of human intelligence will be limited due to the limits and disabilities of human, where advocacy is not an exception. Artificial intelligence, a boom or blow. Let's hear it from the master. May we request Mr. Dama Sheshadri Naidu, former judge of Bombay High Court, senior advocate, Supreme Court of India, to deliver his lecture on the topic, artificial intelligence and advocacy, friends or foe. Honorable Sri V. Justice Rama Subramanya, Judge Supreme Court of India, the Honorable Judges present and the past of Madras High Court and of course Bombay High Court as well, all the dignitaries, the eager legal fraternity and it's my honor to be here truly. It's my Second exposure, first it was virtual, now it's real, but the topic is virtual. That's the irony I had to face. Madurai, I arrived yesterday quite early because from Delhi I couldn't have a straight flight. So I spent the whole day in the hotel. Thereafterwards I visited Minakshi Amman Temple. Then my friends who came along with me told me something about the holiness of this land and its importance. When I googled, I could find Madurai 
is actually Madhura Puri. They say that from the gridlock of Lord Shiva, a drop of nectar fell on the earth that got rather solidified into earth and that's become Madurai. And it is said to be a land of justice because even Lord Shiva was subjected to rule of law by the royal court. That being the history of this land, the holy land. I am privileged and honored to be here. On my last occasion, I was in Goa. From there, I addressed a webinar. I said one thing, tongue in cheek. I may say that again. If I contested elections from North Tarkad, any constituency, I would win. Because the whole of North Tarkad, my relatives. <laughs> Had I been born before 1954, I would have been a Madrasi. Because we hail from Kanchi, Kanchipuram. I am told that still people bearing my surname, Dhamma, there is a village. But since I was born after partition of the state, linguistically speaking, I have become a Telugu man. When Honorable Jesus Ramasubramanyam was a judge in Hyderabad, I had the privilege and occasion to visit him whenever I was in Hyderabad from Kerala. Initially, I thought I could impress him with my spattering of Tamil. So I went and realized I would have two advantages whenever I go. One is I'll have beautiful, tasty filter coffee. And the second thing is completely brain-filling discourses on various topics. I tried to show off talking about Kannadas and, and others. I never knew until then. I was discussing with the epitome of Tamil literature. <laughs> Later, I realized my folly, though. But I say, I grew watching Tamil movies. So to this day, my favorite director is Balachanda. And my favorite actor, it's always between Kamalas and Rajinikanth. Whenever there was a good movie of this man, I would fall in love with this man and shift over whenever the other man had it. And of course, my all-time favorite writer is Kannadasan. Why Kannadasan, though I couldn't speak fluent Tamil, most of his lyricals, lyricals, um, lyrics were translated into Telugu and played on. And mel mellifluous and melodious music director, M.S. Viswanathan. That's my association. Now, I was asked to talk about a topic that's about artificial intelligence and advocacy. Are the friends or foes? My friends, what would you say? Any of you can. How many of you feel that, I'm not addressing the first ranks, I'm addressing the young students and young lawyers, what do you say? How many of you feel that it's a friend? Could anybody raise your hand? Because I raise half hand, because I can't commit myself. Could anybody? Is it a friend or foe? Artificial intelligence in advocacy. Does it help us or does it harm us? What do you feel? It harms us. That's one lone voice I could hear. How about the others? Should I take uh, silence as an acceptance? Right? Because as advocates who have been trained in uh, dichotomy or binary thinking, either right or wrong, black or white, correct or incorrect, but the computers have introduced a field called maybe, and the judges would have it in the name of equity. So let's see how it's going to affect us. If it works, because it's smartphone, the smarter it is, the dumber I am. Let me see whether it works. I hope it works. Alexa, what's the time now? The problem with technology, right? Trust your brains. But it responded. Alexa, what's the time now? It's 12, 12 p.m. Alexa, ring an alarm after 45 minutes. 45 minutes, starting now. Alexa. If you hear this timer, please make sure you've turned off do not disturb and silent mode. <laughs> Alexa, wake me up tomorrow at 4 a.m. Alarm set for 4 a.m. tomorrow. Alexa, will you marry me?
Alexa, will you marry me? It answered yesterday. <laughs> it must have changed its mind. I'll ask one last time so that it may not get what you call. Uh... Yes. Alexa, will you marry me? Ah, there's a mistake. Before I answer that question, let us see how well you know me. I'll ask you three questions and your answer will help me make a decision. Here we go. Here's an easy one. What is my favorite vegetable? Well, Brinjal, eggplant. Your favorite vegetable is eggplant, Alexa? I'll tell. The problem is with the net because there's no Wi-Fi. It will ask three questions. Whatever answer you give, it will say no. And in the end, you say, it will say, we'd better know each other for some more time. Then we can get back. This is what artificial intelligence, that's why I would like to tell the dangers and also the advantages, perhaps the fun as well. Now, we are talking about a concept called artificial intelligence. In the first two place, what is intelligence? Isn't that itself artificial? Perhaps instinct, intuition, as they call gut feeling, as a mammal on earth, we could have inherited. But, but how about intelligence? Let's take the example of speaking. Is it natural? Grunting perhaps is natural, but speaking is a human invention. Of course, there are people who could say that the birds speak, other animals speak. They do communicate. Doesn't necessarily mean they speak. So, then let me come to writing. Is it natural or artificial? It's again artificial. If you look at the etymology of intelligence, interlegere, Latin expressions. Inter means between, legere means to select. The wisdom of choice. Given a few options, you may go for uh, one or another, that is intelligence. Then, what is knowledge? We'll come to that. And also let's think of artificial. What is artificial? Art facere, again Latin, art facere. Art, you know pretty well, it doesn't require any sort of a definition. Something that isn't natural, unless it's an art film, which is very natural. So art is something unnatural, as you can call it creative pursuit, then facere to make. When you make something which is not true, that becomes artificial intelligence. We initially felt that this distinction is sort of tautological. Because when it comes to intelligence, perhaps that in itself is artificial. And artificial, artificiality of intelligence, again, is tautological, means expressing the same thing twice over. We were talking just a while ago about the erudition of Aristotelian era. And you know pretty well, Socrates, his student Plato, and his student Aristotle. Plato, apart from writing wonderful treatises on philosophy, has also recorded his master's dialogues or conversations, sometimes mythical, sometimes real. There is a whole book dedicated to his master that's titled Phaedrus, P-H-A-E-D-R-U-S, Phaedrus. Phaedrus is a character who engages in dialogue with Socrates. Then, kindly watch 
the advocacy on the part of Phaedrus, who says that all modern means of acquiring knowledge must be encouraged. Then the question comes, in a largely illiterate society then, should people learn how to write? Phaedrus says, yes, everybody should, because it helps in spreading knowledge. Of all the people, Aristotle opposes it. Please, an Oxford classic by the name Phaedrus, in that one I have extracted this one kindly see. Phaedrus says, what an absurd question. Please tell me what you say you have heard. Because the conversation as it began, Phaedrus says that, no, it's a must, you should learn. Then uh, Socrates says, no, 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 I've heard a fable. And that says quite an interesting story. And Phaedrus piqued his curiosity and asked him, what is that? Though your proposition is absurd, let me hear that one. He says, Socrates, all right, the story I heard is set in Nucrates in Egypt. There is one intelligent god, god called Theot. This deity was the inventor of numbers, arithmetic, geometry, and astronomy, etc. He also invented writing. At the time, the king of the whole of Egyptian Thebes was Thomas. This Theot comes to Thomas and tells him to spread the skill of writing throughout Egypt. Thomas asks him, the king, what good this writing will do? Theot replies, Your Highness, the science will increase the intelligence of the people of Egypt and improve their memories. For this invention is a portion for memory and intelligence. But Thomas replied, The loyalty you feel to writing as its originator has just led you to tell me the opposite of its true effect. It will atrophy people's memories. Trust in writing will make them remember things by relying on marks made by others from outside themselves, not on their own inner resources. And so writing will make the things they have learned to disappear from their minds. Your invention is a portion for jogging the memory, not for remembering. You provide your students with the appearance of intelligence, not real intelligence. Because your students will be widely read, though without any contact with the teacher, they will seem to be men of wide knowledge when they will usually be ignorant. And this spurious appearance of intelligence will make them difficult company. Then Phaedrus replies, Socrates, it doesn't take much for you to make up stories from Egypt and anywhere else in the world you feel like. He says that it has never happened. You're only telling a story to me just to dissuade me from learning a lot of writing. But when it's a problem, it has manifest ways of looking at it. That's why this dichotomy or this uh, binary thinking may not lead us anywhere. Now, let me talk about the evolutionary path of the human brain, because we have all been afraid that this automaton tomorrow may have all sentient qualifications of feeling, anger, hatred, love, discretion, then does it replace us? That's why let me say how the brains have evolved. Whatever the glorified position we occupy, we are a mammal on Earth. Initially, all mammals, beginning from an elephant, have had huge bodies and little brains. Because the body was essential to secure food. The brain may not have played much role. Then down the line, if you take the genus called Homos, Homos hebilis, Homo erectus, now Homo sapien, and Homo hebilis had very little brain, 
almost like a chimpanzee, but a huge body. But the moment he started thinking of securing food in a cleverer way rather than using his whole body, the body diminished in size, the brain has increased in size. And of all the living beings on earth, body brain proportion, human has the highest. Even then, it occupies 2% of body weight, but takes 25% of energy we take in the form of food. That's why people say, once you are very uh, lean, are you sickly? Are you worried about anything? But worry consumes a lot of calories, at least the belief, belief is. So that way, the brain has started growing in its size. And who knows down the line if the evolution continues. And we'll have only a very big head to support our brain and a very weakling body to carry it. Nothing more and nothing less. So that way, once the path has progressed, now we are here. Then what happened? In 1950s, we have invented something. You call it our savior. You call it our Frankenstein, the computer. So they began the journey. Then came, in mid-50s, the concept of artificial intelligence. Recently, I had the occasion to listen to a memorial lecture series on BBC. It's called Wreath Lectures. In that one, there was a topic about artificial intelligence. You know, the expert says, for a human, the evolution of this brain, it has taken millions of years. That's what we are now, thanks to that evolutionary process. The computer has started evolving about 50, 60 years ago. Down the line, what should happen to its intellect or intelligence? He feels definitely it will as well cross our limitations when it comes to cognition or understanding. But there lies the catch. You have a particular machine in whichever shape, it not only need to be robotics, in whatever shape. And suppose you teach, rather you have the neural circuit designed to play chess. It beats any human being in chess. And you make it have the calculations done. In speed, perhaps it beats anybody. You train it any activity, in any activity, it dominates. But the question is, can it combine many skills as human does? Let me take a simple mundane example. There is a sports person who plays tennis, who plays cricket, and perhaps who plays basketball. With his training in these three disciplines, he can combine these skills and then can apply one into another activity for his advantage. An engineer becoming a lawyer will have an advantage in one particular activity. A doctor becoming a lawyer, vice versa, will have another activity. This combination, does it happen with the machines is the question. Up to now, that hasn't happened. So the AI specialists or scientists call it, whenever there is an invention which is really useful, they call it AI summer. Whenever there is despondency because of its occupation hazard, it's called AI winter. The prediction is next 10 years, Europe will lose 40% of the jobs thanks to AI. This is AI winter. And the question is, will those 40% people be rendered jobless and remain idle and die of hunger? The experience shows no. They diversify and they get into other activities of life. That's why 
it may not be the case is that one then the question is initially when computers were invented the next stage then was supercomputers it required a huge building to have a supercomputer which would not be these days having the calculation power of a handheld phone but that was the beginning then question arose at the time could these systems ever beat human mind one expert has said that it would take a building to house such a human such a supercomputer that would be as tall as touching the moon so we felt we are invincible we are the center of creation and nothing will touch us my young friends have you ever read carl sagan please read him quite a brain expanding substance he writes about carl sagan an astrophysicist by practice but he has written wonderful books on various topics and in one of the books cosmic connection he tells about the human race it's enlightening and also scary let me read one paragraph we are the product of 4.5 billion years of fortuitous slow biological evolution there is no reason to think that the evolutionary process has stopped man is a transitional animal he is not the climax of creation according to him the future development of man will likely be a cooperative arrangement among controlled biological evolution genetic engineering and an intimate partnership between organisms and intelligent machines it was written about 40 years ago but no one is in a position to make accurate predictions of this future evolution all that's clear is that we cannot remain static in a very real sense human beings are machines constructed by the nucleic acids to arrange for the efficient replication of more nucleic acids it would be a great mistake to ignore where we have come from in our attempt to determine where we are going let's see where we are going we all agree that we have said technology is part of us now we must say we are part of technology this is where we have come and we will be going god knows where still god is remembered and most of you may have been familiar with another person richard suskind that oxford professor who wrote a series of books a lawyer turned professor who wrote a series of books on technology advocacy and now artificial intelligence and advocacy etc you know he cites certain examples about the pace of the technological march and how the lawyers have been caught unawares for good or for bad let me say he says in his book that is tomorrow's lawyers third edition 2021 he says consider the number of users of mobile phones or devices now it's more than 5 billion the internet also over 5 billion users of email over 4 billion users and of pay facebook approaching 3 billion think about data in 2010 Google's then chairman Eric Schmidt I'll come about this man in a while Eric Schmidt said that every 2 days we create as much information as we did from the dawn of civilization up until 2003 every 2 days then every 2 days on this view 
we have been generating five quintillion bytes of data god knows quintillion how many zeros it will have five into one zero one eight zeros then according to him digital technology is not a passing fad and that many lawyers in an untutored way still tell me that technology is war hyped they feel all recent talks of ai in the law will prove to be hot air this is grotesquely to misunderstand the trends too few lawyers have heard of moore's law not the law of land but a prediction made in 1965 by gordon moore the man who co-founded intel he projected to simplify that every 2 years or so the processing power of computers would double and its cost would halve then he talks about another expert in the field that's ray kurzweil in his book the singularity is near ray kurzweil gives a practical illustration of the future consequences of moore's law if it continues to hold by 2050 the average desktop machine will have more processing power than all of humanity combined that is the one then let me tell you about this eric schmidt the co-founder of google 3 days ago you predicted it's it hit headlines 3 days ago that by 2030 human beings will become immortal why that man should be believed up to now whatever technological predictions that man has had 85% have come true he is modern nostradamus you know what he says the medical science combined with technology is going for nanobotics nano means you know very very small inestimably small botics means the shortened version of robotics according to him doctors will inject nanobotics into your body they are so tiny they do not interfere with your biological process but they are the sentinels always on the move what they do wherever there is disease the moment a cell faces an atrophy or damage these botics rush to that place they repair instantly so no disease touch, no disease touches you so 2030 you are all assured of immortality <laughs> we are all rather <laughs> that's science and uh, earlier we used to read uh, hg wells jules wen all these people about science fiction now there is no line between fiction and science the whole of it is reality now let me define having seen the evolution the brain its path and then our invention be it our benefactor or our frankenstein that could destroy us whichever way you look at it then let's see the component of artificial intelligence how that's to be taken not everything is artificial intelligence it has tried to answer certain questions when i said it was the time it has said the time but it does not amount to artificial intelligence because it draws from the network and does it but when i ask a question will you marry unfortunately i couldn't demonstrate that fully it's been thinking in a way pre programmed though but it negotiates and it answers and navigates where it would always say no right that's why we need to know the line between machine knowledge and replication of human knowledge by the machine that's a vital difference you know the us federal government wants to bring out comprehensive legislation about artificial intelligence the bill it has introduced has proposed a definition that is ai is systems that think and act like humans or that are capable of unsupervised learning let's see another definition 
technologies that use computers and software to create intelligent human like behavior now a third category ai cognitive computing and machine learning are generally interchangeable terms that all refer to how computers learn from data and adapt with experience to perform tasks called deep learning now let me focus on deep learning what is this deep learning if you study one book perhaps it's learning on the same topic if you study a few more books it's deep learning uh, and what do you call uh, a facile explanation perhaps but a machine's deep learning and in fact a couple of years ago supreme court has constituted a committee that's called artificial intelligence committee then that's what headed by honorable jcc l nageswar rao under the stewardship of the then chief justice of india this is bob day i had the fortune of being a member of it then two technical firms have been invited one from delhi the other from bombay to develop and they agreed indeed voluntarily without charging anything to the supreme court to develop one the translation software for supreme court where anything any language indian language could be converted into english and vice versa the by the time the trials were held the accuracy was more than 90% especially hindi translation as a pilot project hindi marathi and telugu were taken it was sought to be introduced to other things also other languages also and the second one more interesting one was a young entrepreneur a techno entrepreneur has developed a software that was named at by then the facility of that one is first i'll say what it does for a judge and then i'll say what for a lawyer a judge has a brief he has to decide it has four volumes and he has to wade through all the volumes if necessary to know what is what and to correlate the submissions rival submissions of the counsel and eventually render a judgment in that one you simply upload those files into that system software and you keep typing your questions it will answer whatever question you have that's already been there in the matter the answer is there in the matter means it will answer that one and it will give the page number go to page number this is exhibit so and so or annex so and so that's where you find your answer anyway the answer is this that's one there was developed it had its teething trouble but somehow it seems now it's been abandoned that could be quite handy perhaps and for the lawyers as well it will do the same thing why deep learning i said the more matters you feed the more intelligent it becomes it draws data from other similar matters and also it will tell how many cases on the same issue were decided earlier by the supreme court and how many cases are still pending on the same issue right this is the facility that was there and lawyers on the converse they could apply to get the answers for their questions and and if a question has not been answered you feed that question and instruct it saying that you have to be ready with this question next time onwards you need not refeed that question it is ready it becomes part of it so the more you use it the more intelligent it has become this is the facility now are they not commercially available now let's take the example of sec software there data it controlled you can use by putting what you call boolean search 
have all your questions. Suppose you are searching a particular concept in any field of law, and you wanted to see the combination having, say, bail, discretion, or uh, what you call uh, severity of defense. You put all these search marks, and then have, you will get your answer. That's no wonder. Then you have seen dragon, naturally speaking, where you can dictate. It synthesizes human voice into letters and gets it done. It's been there for the last 25 years. We can take advantage of that one. Agreed. It's another feature of deep learning. The more you use, the more familiar it becomes with you and the more accurate it becomes. Then, have you heard about Grammarly? Grammarly.com. You have got a free version, you have got a subscription version. You simply have to do your prepared a plaint or a repetition or an honorable judge may write a judgment. Simply they have to feed that into that one. Then it will point out where the comma is missing, where the full stop is missing, where the grammatical error is there and where the sentence is clumsy, how it can be made stylish, how the readability presentation can be improved. It gives all suggestions. You keep clicking on one after another, you will get a beautiful draft. In the end, it says, as per international writing standards, this particular piece of writing meets 90%, 95%, 80%. Have you heard about a judge called Elena Kagan? An American judge. And uh, all these machines, artificial intelligence, machines of writing skills have tested her writing and every time she scores 100. Please read her judgments. Beautifully written with legal analysis and lucidity. Elena Kagan. And another judge who could qualify with very beautiful writing is Lady Hale. Now present crop of Supreme Court judges at least of US at least four of them are said to be the finest writers. Gorsuch, Kavanaugh, Elena Kagan, and someone else. If you feel like when it comes to improving styles I'm talking about. Now let me come to, suppose you have written, or rather what you call prepared a writ petition. You wanted to know whether that has met the legal standards, whether it has elements which have already been decided, etc. There are certain softwares, I've just noted down for young lawyers, they could as well test them. In the end, I think I've put them. One is casetext.com. Casetext.com. The other one is casemind.com. As, as I know, these are the two ones I could think of, right? There, all that you have to do is feed your draft. It will give you all the case law which involve the dispute you have raised. And also it will suggest, instead of taking this plea, you would better take an alternative plea which may be more. And they have been perfectly working in the environment of US law and UK law. India, they have just introduced about a few years ago, and especially this uh, casemind.com is free for judges. And they can upload. When I was in Bombay High Court, I pleaded with them. You have said 25,000 rupees per year. We are salaried people, we could not do that one. <laughs> if you want us to test this one, it should be given free. Then, across India, for all judicial officers, from whatever rank, they have given it free. I don't know whether they have been continuing. There, you can as well upload your judgment, and it will say, the case law that may apply to that one, which we may not touched upon, and uh, the improvements that can be done with regard to adjudication, all these things it gives. They are all experimental though. And for lawyers too, the drafts, and etc. that's. Now, there is one particular software developed in US and you feed any statute it will say 
what are the conflicting points of that statute in the context of constitutional validation and it will point out whether it will be tested and if it's tested whether it survive the scrutiny of judicial review so an act came out you can as well test it and there's a funny thing also one more software was developed to test american federal court supreme court judges whether they themselves are writing the judgments or their law clerks are writing and the judgments were fed 45% were written by law clerks yes sir i i do i do underline sir i do underline <laughs> it's in the us i do underline that one sir there is one more thing also in the us there is one more thing also that is the council on both sides have to submit draft judgments if at all the court supports their cause what could be the judgment both the ways and please remember nine judges sit together they decide on an average 70 cases a year so each judge hardly writes four or five judgments and they chisel them like fine art and a judge of the honorable supreme court writes every day four or five judgments and in the end where could be the time to chisel even to read there's the burden but always the saying goes from the days of 60s to 2020s perhaps supreme court sometimes bites more than it could chew it accepts cases which may have ended in another constitutional court high court but they travel all the way up and that floods and american supreme court accepts 0.5% of the cases that have been filed before them for judicial review 0.5% and all nine of them should sit all nine of them should sit and to have a case admitted at least four of them should say yes otherwise it will be rejected now let me come back to the technology my friends we have thought of the socratic attitude towards the writing said to be artificial he said that it only gives a sense of knowledge but actually you don't have the knowledge because what's been written that becomes only a memory jogging or aid it's not been internalized according to the school traditional school of learning and now the same theory has come now in 2020s in the name of knowledge illusion you know earlier we used to remember many things educated parents used to bring encyclopedia britannica or year books for their children they used to give them to master the facts with regard to what are the capitals of the world countries what are the flags what is the currency what are the parliaments anything for that matter now we have got google search so they call it the illusion of knowledge we are absolutely ignorant but the machine knows and we feel because we own the machine we also own the knowledge this is called knowledge illusion so when it comes to the debate advocacy has been irretrievably linked to technology there's no getting away accepted that accepted could it be our friend or could it be our foe coming to that one when there was a debate a couple of years ago in us senate about gun control one watery one who supported the guns obviously trumpian views that man said it's not the problem of the gun it's the problem of culture when it comes to the technology whatever it is ai for that matter it's not the problem of technology it's the problem of our adoption is it a human decision 
helped by a machine or a machine decision simply affirmed by a human being that's the dichotomy either you could have that one or you could have this one the former is safer the second one abdication of your intellect 20 years ago daniel amen has said again a neuro doctor scientist he said if you expose yourself every day to internet more than 30 minutes it leads to a syndrome called brain atrophy your brain shrinks in size especially the frontal lobe which remembers all the facts all the spatial memory in london there are about 37000 streets to get a cab license cab driving license you have to master all the streets you must be knowing all the streets 37000 only asian origin boys get qualified for that and most of the cab riders are bangladeshis pakistanis and indians what they do they take a bike they criss cross all the streets for 2 years then they familiarize all the spatial memory then eventually they pass the test one scientist has examined their frontal lobes they are slightly bigger than the normal because they store a lot of physical spatial memory then gps came now they have stopped using any such physical knowledge now they are simply following the machine the same doctor tested most of those cab drivers again 5 years down the line and they have shrunk to normal size and below normal size and uh, if you every lawyer prizes that i should have a wonderful memory unconnected with the machines because the problem with machine is when i ask my office colleagues about any of you for that matter please find some case law on that one within 2 minutes they come back with case law but the problem is they don't know the context of that case they don't know the facts of that case it's something like you ask a machine to play chess with you it beats you but it doesn't know it is chess that is the problem with machine searching that's where you can draw the line we are safe so when it comes to the technology if you can use it to the advantage without surrendering ourselves certainly it's beneficial and as i said let's think of memory as an aid to our prof profession do you know the fact that every year there is memory championship across the world it happens once in a year one guy called joshua fire a journalist was asked to cover i believe i'll take 2 minutes and i'll finish a, a journalist was asked by the employer to cover an event happening in new york he went over there he started covering when he was covering he made friends with one guy to uh, have inside information so that he could uh, write better so that man displayed his amazing memory skills and uh, his name is ed cook the joshua fire was inspired and asked him how could you remember all these things it's humanly impossible i can't even remember my own phone number i have to write it somewhere that man said do one thing it's all technique it's not knowledge well like machines we remember if you ask what that is exactly we can't analyze but i can recollect and repeat everything and this man said everybody who knows says the same thing but i can't remember he throws a challenge do one thing be with me one year i'll make you world champion that man took it seriously resigned and got trained by this head cook joshua fire and next year lo and behold he became america champion and uh, world runner up he could not become world champion but he became world runner up in flat one year from not remembering to becoming world champion then he wrote a book called moon walking with einstein young lawyers could read it's a wonderful book and if you want to know the whole history of knowledge memory and the machine please read one book called memory code by lane kelly you know what they follow is very simple if we take a page of written material 
please remember writing is unnatural as we began so our brain never accepts something in writing but space is quite natural for survival because some predator may ambush us we should know all the spaces all the crevices and then food we should know where it is available how to hide that so space is very important for us so primordially we are designed to remember all spaces what these experts do everything they convert into space if you want say 100 things to be remembered they'll have it's called memory palace they'll have a house which is familiar to you you keep everything in a grotesque manner at one place one place you keep recollecting you will get it of course it's a different story so the bottom line i say is my friends technology is neither a friend nor a foe technology is technology it's value neutral and it is we who import the value and we import the value the way we use it and without surrendering our intellect to the machine let's have that machine serve us that could be the best thing thank you very much any questions customarily i invite yes i will answer no alexa grateful to all of you for this wonderful opportunity sir thank you very much thank you sir thank you for flying us from computers to cosmos we indeed entered into the world of virtual reality with the permission of the chair i would like to ask the same from siri instead of alexa siri what's your take what do you feel about the lecture and our guest speaker i felt like i was in the world of virtual reality thank you for tripping me to the matrix again wait wait a minute i must confess that i am longing to marry our guest speaker but i am sad that he is in love with alexa rather than on me <laughs> thank you sir may i now request ms abisha isaac george to enunciate the observations on behalf of the congregation honorable judges lawyers students and the audience before i begin i must admit that it is very hard to compete with siri for the feedback given and uh, on that note let us take it from here uh, before i begin there's one uh, thing that i would like to say this moment is very special for me because unlike the previous speakers uh, who shared the feedback and probably the ones after as well i have not just been waiting for this moment for the last few days but in fact for 6 months sorry for 6 years in fact because in 2017 i had the privilege of listening to his lordship justice damasha shadri naidu in the tamil nadu judicial academy and i don't know if his lordship remembers but uh, i had the lifetime honor of sharing the days with him as well when he spoke on the very same topic of artificial intelligence and law and till this date his lecture vividly stands in my memory so this is a talk that i wanted to give for the last 6 years from the year 2017 and what an honor it is to do so it has been a wonderful uh, scholarly talk and we are all indeed uh, privileged to listen to this topic which has stirred a lot of emotions among lawyers i would say from such a polymath of a person like his lordship justice dama sashadri naidu in fact it reminds me of a very famous quote of justice benjamin cardoso former justice of the united states supreme court he says the law has always been a jealous mistress but nowadays she has become insatiate in her demands those who would earn her best rewards must make their knowledge as deep as the science and as broad and universal as the culture of their day she will not be satisfied with anything less i think his lordship stock has indeed enlightened us about the reality of today i think as lawyers we are all very steeped into our traditions even by disposition we are all very conservative and risk averse uh, sometimes the topic of artificial intelligence or even technology when lawyers hear it 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 evokes a lot of skepticism and sometimes even leads to outrage but his lordship stock has shown us beautifully that we have no other choice but to embrace this inexorable rise and uptake of technology not just in any other field of today but in the legal hemisphere as well so uh, with these few words i would like to just uh, tell one thing 
uh, his lordship quoted Justice uh, Professor Richard Suskind, and like in 2017, I was very thrilled to hear his name once again because he was my professor when I studied in University College London. And uh, he used to call lawyers who are skeptics of artificial intelligence as irrational rejectionists. He used to often tell that uh, lawyers have this thing, they hold on to tradition so much, they hold on to their old methods and ways, and they rely a lot upon themselves, that the minute they hear about artificial intelligence or technology, they get agitated a lot. But his lordship stock has shown us that we humans are not as invincible as we think we are. We humans have a lot to learn, and uh, it is, we are not the climax of creation, as his lordship beautifully said. However, gaining just from the internet or relying totally upon it is an illusion of knowledge, like his lordship beautifully observed. I think there is one pertinent question with that I will end. His lordship spoke about deep learning, where he said that the machine learns more as it is fed a lot and a lot of information. But there is one pertinent question here. Is law a subject at all which can be fed and put into words? Though laws are there, written, coded, everything, our entire life depends upon interpretation, be it lawyers or the judges as well. That is why probably Robert Louis Stevenson in Aylmer's field called it the lawless signs of law, the cordless myriad of precedents, and the wilderness of single instances, who by wit or fortune, many of you, may lead a pathway to wealth and fame. So when we are in this cordless world, in this lawless signs of law, where every day we thrive by interpretation, every day we talk about the beauty of the subject, the, uh, the many ways in which our judges use it and the lawyers express it in court, I uh, highly uh, doubt whether machine learning, just like his lordship said, would ever replace us as lawyers. Let us, therefore, use it as a supplement, but not to supplant. And uh, just to finish, my lord, uh, yesterday I went across a couple of your lordship's judgments, and I have to tell this, even if I take extra 30 seconds. I've never seen a judge apart from the one and only Justice Krishnayar and a couple of uh, other recent uh, judges who have taken the pain to add a lot of literature and science to their judgments. I've never seen somebody with such passion for not just law and literature, but science, history, everything as well. Yesterday, I read a judgment where his lordship spoke about the rights of a mother who had a child through surrogacy. And few people usually end a judgment with a court, or few people start a judgment with a court. But his lordship is the only person whose judgments I saw were studded with courts, not just from poets, not just from legal theorists, but from activists, from Oprah, from Charles Darwin, and the way his lordship analyzed, I think today's talk was also a testament to that. Exactly, I counted his lordship had quoted 12, 12 people and 12, ranging from scientists to theorists and whatnot. So as my uh, dedication to your lordship, I would like to end this with this quote to describe how wonderful your lordship's talk was. And it is from one of your favorite writers, I think all of our favorite writers, who English cannot live, live without, as your lordship expressed in your judgment, William Shakespeare. He says in Hamlet, and I dedicate this to his lordship, what a piece of work is man, how noble in reason, how infinite in faculty, in form and moving, how express and admirable, in action, how like an angel, in apprehension, how like a god. Thank you all for this opportunity and uh, hope we have a great day today. Thank you. Thank you, Ms. Abisha, for your mindful observation. With this third session comes to an end.